Let's get started. Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting day here. Uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, hopefully assignment two. So assignment two came in this past Wednesday was the hard deadline. Hopefully that went all right. Um, we've got we've got that in the pipeline for grading. We will not be able to get the graded feedback for assignment two back to you quite in the same uh, heroic time frame that we saw for assignment one. We wanted to make sure that you had a, a reasonable amount of time to get um, your assignment one feedback before turning in assignment two. But we'll try to get the feedback to you by early next week. Uh, so reasonable amount of time, but not not this kind of heroic uh, TAs pulling all nighters kind of a uh, kind of time frame. Uh, um, and then the other kind of main announcement for today, I, I I think now is kind of a good point in the quarter to remind you that every lecture has uh, textbook readings. Um, we're starting to reach a sort of point with the content where there's a lot of sort of sort of conceptual understanding. There's a lot of places where maybe there's a lot of math or a lot of kind of where pictures can you know make a make a big difference. Um, it's not just about kind of the code so much anymore. And so I think this is where uh, something like the Bryant and O'Halloran textbook can really kind of shine and explain some of these some of those ideas. So do check out the textbook readings. If there's anything that is confusing about lectures or labs or whatnot, um, see if that is explained in the textbook because it probably is and probably in a lot more detail than we were able to cover. Um, so hopefully that kind of is able to clear up a certain number of those of those of those issues. OK. So let's get into it for today. Uh, for today, uh, the first thing I want to do, so we, we finished up last time with uh, talking about signed and unsigned integers, and you spent a uh, all of your lab this week working through bits and ints. There are a couple of things that you may have seen in lab or maybe didn't quite have time to get to that I just want to review here, like kind of recap here. Um, and then I want to spend the majority of our time today talking about how we're going to represent real numbers. How do we represent stuff that isn't an integer? Right? And we'll see that there are a number of challenges that come, out, come with that. A um, couple of different representations we'll be seeing. All right. So let me go over to the code. Here's kind of a summary of what we're going to try to get from the code. I'll, I leave it in the slides just so that you know, if you go back to the slides, you'll have a, a point of reference. Hopefully that this is what you should be getting from the code. But we'll, I'll, I'll pull it up. Uh, I want to start with the ints.c file here. And so uh, a handful of kind of key points that, so we ended last time talking about the difference between signed and unsigned. And I had this one slide that was just like, Hey, there's some differences. Uh, so I want to actually show you the differences rather than just tell you about them because I think they're a lot clearer in when we actually look at them in code. Also, because that's where they're going to come up when you start on uh, assignment four, which is you know, going out next week. You'll be working with bits and ints, and you may be running into some of these issues. So that's where it's going to it's going to matter. Uh, I'll mostly be walking through the code in GDB, but just to give you a sense of what the code looks like at a high level, uh, we've got the variable names. So for this piece of code are going to tell you what the types are. Uh, so SCH is a signed care. Um, UCH is an unsigned care. Let me just drop into GDB and, and just start walking through it. So the first thing I want to talk about today is what happens when we start mixing and matching signed and unsigned. So this has to do with kind of the last thing that we did uh, last time where we said some stuff about comparisons being different between signed and unsigned. I have that example coming up. But first, I just want to stay on something a little bit kind of more. So first, the, the first example I want to show you is just if I have an unsigned care. And I assign it to a value like 250. Um, and I 
and I copy that value from the unsigned back into the signed care, what will happen? So now that we've executed this line, I can print out uh, the byte, so a care, recall, one byte, eight bits. I can print out the bits for the, for the unsigned care. Um, I'll use, you saw the examine command in GDB uh, during lab this week, hopefully. So I'll use that to examine the byte at UCH. And we can see that, that is the, those are the bits for the number 250. You print out UCH, and you'd see that that, so 250 corresponding to those eight bits. Okay? And if I do this assignment now, so I say SCH equals UCH, what's gonna happen? Well, as the comments say there, we're gonna basically copy those bits into SCH. So if I go back up and I examine the bits for SCH, you'll see that it's exactly the same bit pattern. And you might say, sure, okay, fine, great, that's cool. Uh, what's the big deal? But whereas with the unsigned case, we were representing, we, we had every bit kind of, we didn't have any special bit. In the signed case, this most significant one is now representing a negative. So despite assigning the number 250 to a signed number, um, if we interpret what SCH is, we actually get a negative. The point that I want to make with this example is that when I do an assignment from unsigned to signed or vice versa, there's no conversion. There's no kind of special cases there to say, huh, I think what you're doing is going to cause the value to change or to flip signs or anything like that. We're just going to copy bit patterns from one place to another. Is that all okay? Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, now this is something I show, I just sort of mentioned as a one-liner of the slide last time was that the right shift operator is a little different. This is something that actually came up on Piazza a little while ago, I think, which is um, when I talked about the bit shift operators, I said that when we shift a value right, we fill it in, we fill in the bits, you know, the kind of new, the, the bits on the left with zeros. So a reminder of what the value of UCH was. So we have this. If we shift it right by one, we can see that we filled that slot with a zero and the zero on the right fell off. Okay. And something that maybe you saw a little bit in lab, which is that uh, if UCH was previously the number 250, right, that now it's actually the value 125. So right shifting by one is actually equivalent to dividing by two. Kind of a neat property of the way sort of the binary polynomial works. If you think about this in terms of uh, decimal, if I write a decimal number and I drop off the last digit, that's sort of like dividing by 10 with a little bit of rounding. Um, so same here. If I right shift by one, I'm dividing by two. If I left shift by one, that's a multiply by two. Right. But now let's say I do that for the signed case. So recall what the value of SCH is. Same bit pattern as it was before for UCH. But if I do the right shift by one here, I did not fill it with zeros. I ended up filling the leftmost slot with a one. What's up with that? Well, if I follow the rule that I was sort of, if I follow the kind of convention that I was trying to establish here before, that, if, that, that right shifting by one is like dividing by two, if SCH was previously a negative number, I would not want right shifting to turn the negative number into a positive number. That would be kind of annoying. So instead, we'll keep it negative by the rule here is that if I right shift, so we are able to in fact get division by two with a right shift. And the reason we're able to do that is that 
And this only applies to the right shift operator. Everything, all the other bitwise operators work the same way. But when I do a right shift operator on a signed number, at least on our system, uh, the new kind of gaps that are created are filled on the left are filled in with copies of the sign bit. They're not always filled in with ones. I should be clear about that. They're filled in, you fill it in with a one if the number was previously negative, you fill it in with a zero if the number was previously positive. That way we can, pre we can preserve the sign of the number. So the number was negative before, you do a right shift, it's gonna stay negative. If the number was positive before, you do a right shift, it's gonna stay positive. Questions about that? And then the last thing that I had in this function is something that we already saw, but just with a couple different examples. This is uh, asking whether or not if I compare to, if I compare a signed and an unsigned number that the result may surprise you. In this case, negative one is being treated as a very large uh, positive number, not as a negative number, because unsigned would dominate the comparison. And therefore, we get that negative one is not, in fact, less than two. So just some stuff to watch out for as we, this is, so generally speaking, we use an unsigned when we need to work with bits. Um, and so they can have some kind of, and, and when we actually need that kind of right shifting behavior. But it's maybe not such a great idea to just always throw around unsigned when we think that a number isn't going to be negative because we can run into issues like this um, where mixing and matching signed and unsigned types is not always the greatest thing. Uh, so, so generally, we're going to be pretty conservative about using unsigned, um, except here where we actually need to work with the bits, then it actually makes sense to do that. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you for the signed case. Yeah. 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 So so for the unsigned case, if I shift right by one, that's dividing by two. If I shift right again, that's still that's dividing by two again, right? For the signed case, it will continue to do that, and that's part of the reason that this what's called sort of this um, copying the sign bit is a good idea. Is that we are able to continue basically dividing by two every time I shift right. Um, there's obviously some rounding there. So if I take we can actually do this. So if I take, uh, let's see, SCH, and I can print out what is SCH right shifted by one. I hope this, whoa, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I shouldn't just make up a thing. Oh, good, it worked. Okay. Um, that we see that it's sort of divided by two, except that, you know, there's, there's an issue with rounding, right? Like, do you want one or do you want two? You're not going to get 1.5, so. Um, but it will mostly keep dividing by two every time I shift. Unsigned int that's out of range. What if you set a signed int to an unsigned int that's out of range? So do you mean the case with the 250 up here? Like, so here, uh, I think that's what I was doing up here, and correct me if I'm not answering your question, which is that um, up here I had an unsigned care, which is mean, the same thing, right? Int care, this is just one byte. That is 250, which is outside of the range of the signed care. So when I just do the assignment, then what I get back is I just get uh, negative six. I, I get, it doesn't stay 250. It looks negative now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and if I go the other way, if I take a negative number and I stick it in an unsigned, then I get a big positive number. Because it's just going to interpret the bits however it's going to interpret the bits. Does comparison with size t look the same as unsigned int? Uh, size t happens to be, so the question is, does comparison with size t look the same as, work the same as comparison with unsigned int? Size t is an alias, it's, this, it's a synonym for unsigned long, so it will work the same way as an unsigned long. It happens to be a long because we're on 64-bit machines, and so we want, some of our sizes might exceed the limit of an int, but yes, it will work like comparison to an unsigned type because that's what it is. So the, so the question is, why does negative one less than two not work? The reason is that uh, here, let's see, I've got a, did I skip it? No, here we go. So I've got the signed int negative one, and I've got the unsigned int 
2. And here I'm comparing the signed int to the unsigned int. The, in this case, it's not, in this case, we could have represented the 2 in using a signed int, right? And that would have worked out. Um, so if I had made ui a signed int, um, which had the value 2, then the comparison would have worked. However, in C, if I'm comparing a signed and an unsigned of the same type, the unsigned comparison will dominate. No matter what the numbers are? Yeah, no matter what the numbers are. Because it doesn't, it, it can't look at the numbers directly and say, oh, well, I guess I could have represented the number 2 using a signed int, and maybe that's what you wanted. Um, it's not that smart. It just says signed versus unsigned. OK, I'm converting them both to unsigned, and you're just going to get that comparison. <laughs> so mostly just a caveat to watch out for as much as a more, more than it is like, hey, here's a great reason for why we do this. Because there isn't really one. Anything else? OK. Uh, so. The next kind of piece that I want to mention, um, this is something that you actually pretty much saw in lab, so I'm not going to go, I'm going to go over it a little more quickly. Um, but essentially that we can generalize, so everything I did in lecture up until now was in terms of cares, except for that one weird example, um, that everything was in terms of these 8-bit, eight, 1-byte eight values. We can generalize that, uh, we can generalize to Shorts and ints and longs, um, the same idea with choose complement and the binary polynomial and everything we learned last time uh, continue to apply here. So just as an example, here is the number circle again. Hopefully you recall this from last time. But now I'm doing it for ints, which are 32 bits. Uh, so I can't write all the bits out anymore, and I just use lots of dots. But the same idea continues to apply. This would be for signed int. Um, negative 1 is still to the left of 0, and 1 and 2 are still to the right of 0. And then down here we've got the, the biggest sort of positive number, and then the biggest magnitude negative number. Um, I'm also showing here you know, the constants int max and int min, which are um, because we really don't want to remember what these numbers are. It's not that interesting exactly what the values are. So if you had to know that an int can represent roughly 2 billion numbers, that's probably pretty useful just as a, as a thing you'd want to you'd wanna know because if you go past 2 billion, uh, you're, you're going to overflow. Right? But if, to know that it, the value is exactly 2,147,483,647, not nearly as interesting. Okay. Uh, so I've got more code, but this is basically going to be from uh, what we saw in, in lab. The idea is that if I mix and match variables of different sizes, that, the, um, that when I, if I truncate, we're just going to copy the, we're just going to copy the bits. Um, maybe I'll show one example of this, which is, if I go next. Uh, so truncation here, I've kind of, I kind of walk through it. Um, here, I'll just, I'll just do it. Um, so here I've got a short, I'm writing in hex for convenience. And if I examine, if I look at the hex, uh, so I've taken this short and I've assigned it to cares. And the point that I want to make here is that if I look at them, that all I've done is copy the bits. So I've copied the last two hex digits. So remember that two hex digits represents a whole byte. So I've copied the, I've copied the least significant byte over. Um, this does mean that the signed, that despite our original number being positive, our new care is now negative. So the sign can flip. And then maybe the more interesting example is if I take uh, so we so basically okay. I'll just I'll summarize this. It's the same as we saw with the the shift operator uh, shifting right, which is if I take a number like a short and I assign it to a bigger number like an int or a bigger type like an int. The question is, what do I fill with? Right. So before I had 
two bytes, my short had two bytes, and now I go up to four bytes, what do I, what do I fill those extra two bytes with? Well, the answer is going to be that with an unsigned, I'll fill with zeros, but with a signed, I will fill with a, if the source type, if I assigned from an unsigned short uh, to an int, then I'll fill with zeros. So I filled that with zeros in this case. But if I assign a signed type to an int, then I'll fill it with copies of the signed bit. So this is the same thing that we saw. Oh, I didn't put this code in the 107 directory. Sorry. So, um, oops. But you see that we fill, again, with copies of the signed bit, which is consistent with the intention to preserve the value. The intention is that we want to keep if, it, if the number was negative, if I put it into a bigger type, I probably want to keep it negative. Now you might say, well, what if I put it into an unsigned type? Well, it doesn't matter. Um, C had to pick something. And in this case, if the source was negative and signed, then we'll copy the signed bit into, the, into this part. Okay. Uh, so, here. Any issues about that? Um, I realize that that last piece was a little quick. Um, I will put the code example in the directory. You also have an example from lab, um, and you'll be seeing this uh, kind of throughout. So, um, but I don't want to. I don't want to dwell on on ints too long. Um, is there anything? Any kind of last things on ints before we move on? All right, I want to spend the most, most of our time today talking about real numbers. Uh, this is going to be a bit of an involved discussion, mostly, in term, mostly on the slides. And then I'll have, uh, I want to save some time at the end for a nice code example for how the heck we actually use any of this stuff. But um, so yeah, let's, let's just get into that. Okay, so I want to generalize. So we had this really cool idea, um, just a reminder of sort of how we got to the int representation last time. We had this cool idea about place value, and we ended up talking about this binary polynomial. We said, hey, um, you know, if I, have, if I have a decimal number like 567, then I've got you know, a ones place, a tens place, and a hundreds place. I can write those as powers of 10. But then we might realize that, well, hey, if I have decimals, like a 0.89 here, I can continue the place value trend past the decimal point. And I can say that the 8 is in the tenths place, and I can say that the 9 is in the hundredths place. And I could represent those, you know, 1 over 10 or 1 over 100, as negative powers of 2. Yeah? So we can do the same thing. For binary, so here I have kind of the uh, part of the sort of binary polynomial again, um, where I, I'm using the powers of two from three down to zero. I've written out what those values are. So two to the third is eight, two to the second is four, two to the first is two, and two to the zero is one. So we can see that this this bit pattern, right, zero one zero one, is representing four plus one, which is five. And now I could say, hey, well, I want to represent some fractions. So I'm going to stick a point here. This is not a decimal point now. It's kind of a binary point, but same idea. And now oh, off on this side, I can have negative powers of 2, 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, and 1 sixteenth, corresponding negative powers of 2. Right, And if I have a 1 in this position and a 1 in this position, then I can say that this 1 represents 1 half, this 1 represents 1 fourth, and so now our total number is 4 plus 1 plus a half plus a fourth, which is 5 and 3 quarters, or 5.75. Questions about this? So we're just going to generalize. 
the polynomial to negative powers of 2. And that leads us in to a sort of a, a, a first attempt at representing real numbers. This one is called fixed point. And so we could do something like, like this. We could say, well, I've got 8 bits, so I'm only going to do this for 1 byte numbers. Um, I've got 8 bits, and I'm not going to worry about negatives. So I could use 4 bits for the whole part of the number, and I could use 4 for the fractional part. And just like we saw on the previous slide, I could represent a number from, uh, so the whole part with 4 bits, I can represent numbers from 0 to 15. And then with the fractional part, I could represent 1 16th intervals. I can go all the way down to 1 16th, right? Um, so I can you know, represent any fraction of 16. And so here, the number line, you know, here's how, kind of what the number line would look like. Uh, I've got 0 out here, not worrying about negatives. And then I've got these kind of evenly spaced you know, I've got numbers spaced evenly along my number line at 1 16th intervals until I get out to 15 and 15 sixteenths. Okay, let me go through one more example of how we could convert, uh, you know, how we could do a fixed point. So here, you know, I've got this bit pattern, 0, 0, 1, 0, point. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now, I should say I'm writing in the binary point for our own kind of convenience, but I could take, you know, I could take these bits and just put them into a byte. There's no point, and then just kind of know that the first four, the most significant four, you think about your upper and lower four, upper and lower n from, uh, from lab, right? Like your upper four would be the, the whole number part, and your lower four would be the fractional part. So we can see that this uh, this bit pattern represents 2.5, right? Because I've got a 1 on in the 2 position, and I've got a 1 on in the 1 half position. Yeah? And so just as kind of a proof of concept, uh, this system is actually pretty convenient for doing a lot of math. Uh, so if I just want to do addition, for example, this is actually pretty, uh, pretty nice. Here I kind of just walk through the addition. Um, but, you know, so here I've got the 5.75 and I've got the 2.5. And recall from grade school adding up decimals, I do the 7 plus 5 and I get the, I do the carry across the decimal point. Here we've got, we're going to do it with the binary. Uh, so lots more carrying. I can still carry across the binary point. And then we can convert the value back. So now I've got this answer. I've got this answer, 1000.01. Zero, 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 one. Realize that this 1 represents the, the 8 or 2 to the 3rd. And this one, this 1 over here represents 1 fourth. And so sure enough, I get 8 and a quarter. Um, how's that? Any, any issues about this? Okay, we're moving a little quickly through this. So, Yeah, so I just I threw a point in and then kind of everything else looks the same. Um, yeah. Um, so generally, is the point always placed halfway? Through yeah. The data? Yeah, you're asking a good question. So it's, the question is, is the point going to be placed halfway? And we're going to realize that we, well, I, I picked that arbitrarily at this point, right? Um, and that's going to lead into what uh, some of the problems are. So I guess the answer to your question is generally nobody uses this. Uh, and the reason, and we'll see why that is. Um, if, but this is actually used in some particular applications, in which case you just kind of have to pick where you're going to put the point. You just have to say, here's the limit of, here's the range of whole numbers that I'm willing to represent, and here's the range of fractional parts that I'm willing to represent. But we will see that there are some pretty big downsides to using this representation. Um, 
But for now, I just want to warm you up to the idea of representing fractions in this kind of direct translation or direct generalization of what we've seen so far with ints. I can use negative powers of two, represent one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, um, as we as we have. And so is there anything about that part that's kind of <coughs> unclear? OK. OK, so we've got this representation. Um, and so now that we have a representation, I think it's easier to discuss kind of what the limitations are. Before I gave you a representation, I could have said, oh, well, here, let me just jump right into showing you what we actually do. But the problem is that then if I say, oh, well, we're trying to solve this problem, you're like, I don't see a problem. So, um, so now that we have a representation, we can maybe discuss a little bit about what kind of some of the problems may, may be. There are actually a couple of problems that are going to be fundamental to just representing any real number system. So kind of big picture here, right? So kind of back up a little. We are trying to represent an infinite number line in a finite space. This was true of integers too, right? We could have arbitrarily many, you know, we had in infinitely many integers, and we were trying to pack them into a, like four bytes or however many bytes. But the real number case is a little harder than that. Because now, not only do we have, does the number get infinitely large, which is something that we just kind of got over, like, oh, for ints, oh, well, uh, we're just going to stop at some point. We're just going to not allow you to go over 2 billion or something. But now, between any two real numbers, any two you know, distinct real numbers, there are actually infinitely many real numbers between them as well. So between 1 and 2, there are infinitely many real numbers. Between 0.5 and 0.4, there are infinitely many real numbers. And so now we've got this, and so we've really got this very limited number space. And we have to start thinking very carefully about how, you know, like, so, so there's just going to be tons of numbers that we can't represent. Um, and, and we want to start thinking about what exactly those numbers are. What exactly is it that I can or can't represent? So here's an example from decimal. The number one third cannot be represented exactly as a decimal, right? I could, if I, uh, finitely anyway, if I start writing 0 0.33333, at some point I'm going to stop writing. I'm going to run out of paper. My hand's going to get tired. And I'm going to be like, well, that's it. It's an approximation. Uh, that's the closest I'm going to get. Um, so there are going to be some numbers like one third that just cannot be represented no matter how how much I try. I cannot, like, no finite representation will support representing one third, um, in, in decimal at least. What is maybe a little surprising is that the same numbers that can be exactly represented in decimal aren't always exactly representable in binary. So here I have the number 0.4, 4 tenths. Nice compact decimal representation. You know, I write 0 0.4, and that's an exact number. Turns out you can't represent that exactly using negative powers of 2. I can keep trying to cut out powers of 2. I can say, well, 0.4, you know, OK, let's take out a fourth, and then I'm left with that, and let's take out an eighth, and I'm left with that, and let's take out a 64th, and I'm left with that. And I'm just going to end up keep, go I'm just gonna keep going. There is, I'll end up repeating at some point, but there is no terminating binary representation of the number 0 0.4. And no matter what system we come up with, we will eventually come up with a better system um, for other reasons, but we will not be able to solve this problem. We will never be able to exactly represent 0 0.4 using a binary representation. It is just not going to happen. Question. Yep. Does that mean that number So the question is, does that mean something like pi could be represented? The answer is going to be no. Um, the reason is it's irrational. And uh, like, so the, the, <laughs> the reason that, so the, the things that are going to be exactly representable by our system are, are uh, combinations of powers of two. 
right? So we've been doing, you know, one half, one fourth, one eighth. If you think about the decimal system, we had one tenth, one one hundredth, one one thousandth, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess if you had a base of pi, but I don't know what that would look like, um, then sort of, but because pi is irrational, like there's no, the whole point is that there was no fractional representation of that value. So no, like no meaningful base is going to represent it. But that's a, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, so there are some numbers like the irrational numbers, pi, e, you can think of some fun, fun irrational numbers that aren't representable exactly using any, uh, sort of fractional representation. Um, and then, and then there are these. Yep. So, like, how do navigation systems or things that require accurate, <coughs> like, numbers <coughs> overcome that thing? Yeah. So the question is, like, how do things that really need accuracy, right? Like, I can't, like, yeah, how do, how do systems that require accuracy overcome this? That's pretty much the entire discussion of, like, all of this, the, the rest of the lecture and all of next week, uh, lab, and most of the assignment is the reality is we're not going to get precise mathematical accuracy. If you're a mathematician and you're like, oh, well, I want to exactly represent four tenths, um, maybe the best you can do is a fraction, but like, you know, we're not going to get true mathematical accuracy. Um, as it turns out for something like a, a GPS system or something like even if you think about uh, systems that are going into space or doing, you know, kind of all variety of things that you think need to be super, super accurate, there is a limit to how accurate they have to be, right? If I'm estimating the distance between, you know, stars and stuff, if I miss by a mile, I'm probably fine. Right. So there's going to be some limit to the accuracy that you require. And it is very important that you understand what that limit is. Oh, I, you know, I'm okay as long as I can get kind of within one, you know, nanometer, everything's going to be all right. And then, okay, we can go on with that. Anything else? Okay. So these are limitations of the actual just kind of any real number system that we come up with where I represent, uh, you know, as a finite sort of decimal or finite kind of a fractional representation. But there are actually a couple of limitations of uh, the system of the fixed point system I just talked to you about where I've got the four, you know, the four whole number bits and the four and the four fractional bits. And the limitation is that the range feels super narrow, right? It's like, what? I can't represent numbers bigger than 15. How am I supposed to use this thing? And, um, and so it's like, the thing is, all right, I've got two to the eight bit patterns, right? If I have one byte, I'm allowed 256 bit patterns. That's not that many. So I probably want to be really, really careful about how I'm assigning one bit pattern, like, how I'm allocating those bit patterns. Do I really need a bit pattern for this number? Do I really need one for this number? Because if the answer is no, then I should probably take that bit pattern and assign it to some other number that could make more use of it. So th let's think, you know, uh, the system, uh, the, the fixed point system is able to represent a number like uh, 15.9375, which is uh, 15 sixteenths. But do I really care about that extra 1 16th? Is 15.9375 really that interesting as of a difference compared to 15.875 that I really want to reserve a whole bit pattern out of my 256 possible patterns just to represent that difference of 1 16th? And you know, what about 13 16ths and 12 16ths and 11 16ths? Once I'm getting out kind of out around here, maybe I don't care that much about distinguishing between every 1 16th. Maybe what I really want to do is just represent more numbers. Maybe I want to represent 16 and 17 and 18 instead. Right. Well, it turns out we have a system for that in decimal. So this is going to motivate. Okay, so that is the fixed number, fixed point representation. It is used in some cases, but we're actually going to see something kind of completely different for how we're actually going to represent real numbers. And the motivation for that 
comes from something that we actually have in decimal. So here are a variety of numbers that I might want to represent. And you'll notice they all have something kind of in common, which is that they all have this, the, like, the sort of the value of these numbers is all 3.5 or 35 of something, scaled to various magnitudes. And if you recall from your natural sciences, uh, you may recall learning about significant figures, and you'd realize that all five of these numbers have the same number of significant figures. They have two, the three and the five. But they're at different, different magnitudes. And so here's what I mean when I'm talking about, you know, do I really care about representing all the, all the different sort of granularities? If I'm at, what is this number, 3.5 uh, trillion, I think it is? Uh, yeah. If I'm at like 3.5 trillion, do I really care about being able to represent 3.5 trillion plus 0. 0.0001? Probably not. What's a lot more interesting to me is, you know, if I go from 3.5 trillion to 3.6 trillion, what's more interesting to me is, or, or even, you know, 3.51 trillion, representing uh, different numbers kind of closer to this, closer to, in magnitude to this number. So we have a solution for this in decimal, and that solution is scientific notation. So here is the scientific notation for each of these numbers, 3.5 times 10 to the something. And what's kind of neat about, the, you, you might notice about the scientific notation is that I'm not really defining what space means here, but roughly speaking, all five of these numbers take up the same amount of space. Right? They are like 3.5 times 10 to the something for some relatively small exponent between negative 9 and positive 12. And this just feels so much more efficient than writing out all the zeros in this case or in this case. And it feels like it's kind of getting us a lot closer to the kind of numbers we want to represent. We could represent a really, really large number in the same space by just taking this exponent and using the same number of digits, just if I change that 12 to a 90, now I have a much larger magnitude number. If I change this negative 9 to a negative 50, now I have a much smaller number, a, much, a number that's you know, a lot closer to zero. And given the kind of applications that we might want to use real numbers for, you know, think in terms of the sciences or uh, in terms of graphics, um, kind of any, any case where I would probably care about real numbers, I probably have some general sense of the magnitude of the numbers. And then what I really care about is representing kind of the significant figures within that magnitude. So the insight from scientific notation, which is something that we're going to carry into the, into the float space or into, uh, into the, uh, the binary space. And I, let the word float slip, but you've already seen floats, so. Is that scientific notation is able to split our number into two pieces. Instead of writing, instead of using all these zeros to represent the magnitude, I'm just going to represent the magnitude of the number separately. I've got two distinct pieces. One is kind of the exponent, the power of 10 that I'm looking at. And then the other piece is the actual significant figures, the actual kind of value that I'm interested in representing. And by splitting them up, I'm able to represent this nice wide range. Is that okay? So here's what we actually do. Now I should say, uh, like I kind of alluded to earlier, fixed point is used in certain situations where you happen to know a very specific range of numbers that you might want to represent. Uh, in the operating systems class is actually where I, where I first saw it was, which is that you, it turns out in that case, using a, uh, this sort of scientific notation is actually a little more complicated. You'll see that it is more complicated. So in some cases, yeah, you know, fixed point was the right thing to do. Addition's really easy. Binary polynomial, you know, pretty straightforward to convert from uh, sort of decimal to binary and things like that. So there are reasons to want to use fixed point, but they're pretty specific. They're pretty customized. If we want to design, you know, the, the designers of C and the designers of 
computer hardware wanted to make a system that worked for everyone, wanted a system that would allow for the, you know, the astrophysicist to represent distances in galax between galaxies, wanted to allow a system that, you know, could represent the, the sort of, you know, the chemist to do kind of these, you know, minute, these really tiny sort of masses of particles and atoms and stuff. And so for that more general system, uh, scientific notation, this, all these ideas are, are the way to go. The system is called floating point. So that's where the word float comes from. Um, here's just a kind of quick intro into, into float. I will talk more about the different C uh, floating point types later. But if I have a 32-bit number, then I would split it into a sign bit, um, a few bits, in this case, 8 for an exponent, and then a few bits for the significant figures. That's also called the significand, um, which probably the word I'll be using a lot. You'll also hear mantissa. But... Uh, they're all, they all kind of mean the same thing. Um, and so, you know, the exponent's going to represent the, the power of 2 that we're looking at. Uh, so here's kind of the rough equation for what, you know, the sort of the conversion of a floating point number to decimal. Um, instead of using a power of 10, since we're in a binary system, oops, yeah, since we're in a binary system, the exponent is going to be a power of 2. The significant is represented over here. Now, you might recall from scientific notation that in order to write a number in scientific notation, you needed the number before the decimal point to be between 1 and 9 in decimal. Well, now we're in binary. Uh, we don't get 2 through 9. So the number in front of the binary point is always going to be a 1. And so this gives us um, just a, a quick sense of what the numbers look like for what we're able to do. This gives us a range from negative 2 to the 126 to positive 2 to the 127. That's a huge range. Uh, if we you know, convert that to decimal, we're talking about 10 to the negative 38. So that's 0.38 zeros in a 1, or 37 zeros in a 1, all the way out to 1 followed by 38 zeros an amazing range that we can represent in 32 bits. Now, at this point, you might say, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. I know 32-bit representations. That was the same number of bits we had for ints. And for ints, I could only represent numbers from 0 to about 2 billion. So how come you can say that we can represent numbers from this small up to this large that, you know, you can't create bit patterns out of thin air. Right? We only had four bytes. You only have this many bit patterns. And what you'll start to realize is that the kind of sort of what we're actually giving up a lot of different values. There are actually going to be, and we'll come back to this next week, there are going to be some ints that we just can't represent using this float. So what the number line for float looks kind of more like this. Recall from the fixed point number line where we had those, you know, the, the tick marks spaced evenly apart? What we actually get is something that looks more kind of like concentrated near zero. So we've got, so down, whenever I have a, when I have a number really close to zero, I'm able to represent more, I, I essentially have more bit patterns to represent kind of the, the, the fractions around zero. But then when I get out to this 10 to the 38, we'll start to see that out there, we're skipping lots and lots of numbers, <laughs> lots of whole numbers. Now, don't even worry about fractions. We're just skipping sizable chunks of whole numbers in order to get this representation to work. But we figure that that's kind of OK, because you know, sort of the analogy is, well, if Bill Gates earns an extra dollar, probably not going to make a big difference to his net worth. Right. Um, once you've once you're out kind of in this huge, these huge numbers in the uh, you know ten to the ten to the fifteen, ten to the twenty, every little change of one or point one is not that interesting, and so we'll just choose not to represent them. Is this okay? 
Okay. So, all right. Now, I could do the rest of this lecture in terms of the 32-bit uh, float, but that's not, that would not be good because I don't want to write out 32 bits every freaking time. I want to do any interesting uh, float comparison con conversions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce, and this is consistent with the textbook. So don't worry that this is this isn't totally coming out of thin air. Um, that your textbook has has this as well, which is that I'm going to introduce something that I'm going to call a mini float. This is not a real type in C. Do not try to declare a mini float. It will not exist. But it's just going to be a simpler type. It's an 8-bit type. That will allow us to represent, that will allow us to just kind of get, get some examples of how these floating point numbers work. The mini float is gonna have one sign bit, just like the, uh, the regular float, because you don't really need more than one. Uh, it's gonna have four exponent bits, it's gonna have three significant bits. Okay? So still kind of looks like that, but fewer bits now. All right. So let me tell you how each of these parts of the mini float actually works. The sign bit is very simple. In fact, it's way simpler than signed ints. All the sign does is, okay, if the sign bit is one, it's a negative. If the sign bit is zero, it's a positive, or I guess it's or zero. Um, and the sign flips independently of the other bits of the number. We're not using two's complement. If you remember the, our brief discussion of sign and magnitude last time, where we said, okay, we've got the rest of the bits to represent you know, our number, and then we've got the sign you know, on or off for positive, negative, that's what we're doing. Now, you might remember from last time that we said sign and magnitude had this kind of annoying thing where it had a double zero. You could represent a negative zero by having the sign bit on and then the rest being zero. Yeah, that's going to come up again. Well, we have a negative, we have a negative zero. Uh, so it's the cost of doing business here, right? We just, this representation turns out is just going to be easier. So we just have to, the hardware just has to deal with the negative zero. Okay. Now, the exponent, we want to be able to represent kind of a variety of negative and positive exponents. So I could make the exponent go from 0 to 15. I remember I have four bits for the exponent. So four bits, I could go from 0 to 15, but that means I can't represent many fractions. I can't represent kind of these smaller, uh, these smaller exponent numbers. So I'm going to have it go from kind of negative x to positive x. So we'll kind of split it halfway. But uh, so here's, here's a number circle. It's the same number circle that we, we knew from, uh, from, two's, from two's complement, but with four bits. Um, but I want to show you kind of the the way we're going to end up representing this exponent is a little wacky. So you might think, oh, okay, I could just put 0 here, put negative 1 here, put uh, positive 1 here, and just kind of do the normal thing. That's not what we do. Um, I won't explain why. Uh, there is a really compelling reason for it, but uh, it's hard to get into. But I will tell you what we do do, which is first we reserve the exponent all zeros and all ones. We'll just Cut those out and say we're not going to use them uh, right now. We're going to use them for something else. So for now, don't worry about either of these two. And then what we want to actually do is we want to put the negative, the sort of the smallest exponent around here, and we want to put the largest exponent over here. So this is called a biased exponent, and here's how we actually fill in the number circle. So 0, an exponent of 0, shows up actually down here at 0, 1, 1, 1, at where our maximum positive int was. Then if I keep going clockwise, I get 1, 2, and all the way up to positive 7. If I go counterclockwise, I go through the negative exponents down to negative 6. There's, there's a little bit of asymmetry. I can't quite get to negative 7 because I had to reserve, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's an asymmetry from, from the 0. But that's what we have. Um, OK, so we've got the 0 down here, and then positive going around clockwise, just like before. Going counterclockwise, just like before, uh, goes negative. But we're just picking a different place for 0.
And so I can give you a formula for how to figure out. So the way this is going to work, um, uh, let me actually do this. So the way this is going to work is, so this is called the bias. So if you think about, um, so if I take this bit pattern, right, it represents the number, the integer 7. 0, 1, 1, 1 represents the integer 7. And if we want to actually figure out what the real exponent of the, of our float is going to be, then I take the bit pattern and I subtract a certain number. And then the number that I subtract is called the bias. And in this case, we can kind of see that I subtract 7. All right, so I start at 0, 1, 1, 1, and if I subtract 7, I get to 0, which is what this exponent represents. If I start at 1, 0, 0, 0, and I subtract 7, then I end up with 1. So 1, 0, 0, 0 is 8. Subtract 7, I get 1, and that's what the bias. So the bias of a mini float is 7. Um, and that's how you calculate it. It's in terms of the number of bits in the exponent. Yeah. We'll get lots of practice with this. Um, I know I'm going through each of these parts somewhat kind of quickly, and I know there's a lot of little pieces. I kind of just need to make sure we know what the pieces are before um, I can give sort of good examples of them. Um, so then now, the last part, so we've got this exponent, it has this weird bias thing, but roughly speaking, it represents, you know, 2 to the negative 6 up to 2 to the positive 7. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I've got the significand, which, as we said before, was always 1 point something. Uh, because in scientific notation, if I'm in binary, uh, I don't want a 0 out in front before the binary point. Just like in scientific notation, didn't want the 0 out in front with decimal. So the uh, sort of sig figs are always going to be one point some number. And it turns out we can just choose not to represent the, we can write not to write down the one. OK, so here is the formula uh, to, to know. Here's the one that you want to know and the one that we're going to keep using over and over again, which is if I have the number positive or negative, one point something. Now, I've written this uh, little 2 here, this little subscript 2, to indicate that this one point something is in binary. So think of each of these s's as a 0 or a 1. So if I've got the number in binary scientific notation, one point something times 2 to the something, um, so I would want, so times, you know, so 2 to the something, um, then this is how the bits get mapped. So the colors and the letters should kind of correspond where um, we've got the sign bit in front, and then we've got the exponent, but after the kind of the bias was added back in up here, and then we've got the significand, but notice we're not writing the 1 into the bits. So we're going to write down these three bits, but we're not going to write down the one point because it's always one point. Okay, so let me give you an, ex let me give you an example because I realize I just kind of threw a whole bunch of facts at you. This is the formula that you want to know. I'll keep it on the top of the slide for pretty much the rest of the lecture. Um, so let's just walk through a couple examples and see if we can kind of get a hang of this. First, I want to take this bit pattern and I want to convert it to its sort of its decimal value. So how are we going to do that? Okay, so we've got uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then 0, 0, 0, okay? So I will, I basically want to take these bits, right, um, based on the color and based on kind of their position, and I want to map them into this formula. So I can kind of do that, just basically exactly following the color. I get 1.000, that's in binary, times 2 to the, I interpret this, these exponent bits as an unsigned int. Uh, we will not treat this bit as a signed bit. We are not doing that. This is just an unsigned int. So I read 0, 1, 1, 1 as 7. And so I get, I fill in this formula. I didn't write the positive sign because 
it's positive, which is 1.0 or 1.000 times 2 to the 7 minus the bias. And if I work that out, that's 1 times 2 to the 0. And this bit pattern is the mini float for 1.0. What's that? 2 yeah. under the 0. The 2 here, right? This right here? Yeah. Is indicating that I want to remind myself that this number is being represented in binary. Um, and we'll see that. We don't see why that matters yet. Because 1.0 is 1.0 no matter what base you're in. But when I get to the next example, you'll see why that matters. That kind of makes sense? Cool. Anything else? Now would be a great time for a question because I just kind of info dumped. OK. Should we just work out another example then? All right, let's just do another example, and then we'll have some time to to kind of fill in. OK, so here's another example. Um, I'm representing 0, and then my exponent is, so I'm, I'm kind of just going to do the binary to the, like, the int binary to decimal conversions sort of in my head based on the fact that these are only four bits, and maybe you have a hex chart, maybe you have something else. But so this is, the exponent here is uh, 9, or the sort of the biased exponent is 9, and then I have 0, 0, 1. So how do we convert that to a decimal value? Well, fill it in with the table. So here is why the, the base 2 matters. That, so I'm writing 1.001, but that's in binary. Do not think of this as 1 and 1 over 1,000. This is in binary. Get back to that in a second. Times 2 to the, uh, so this, these four bits represent the number 9 minus 7. So we can see that this is going to be 2 to the 2. Right, 9 minus 7 is 2. And then here, what is 1.001? Well, here we can kind of use what we learned from the binary polynomial. The first bit here represents a half. The next bit here represents a fourth. And this bit represents an eighth. So what we actually have here is 1 and one eighth, I've written it in, in decimal, but you could write this as one and one eighth times two to the two. And if you work out what that is, then you get the value 4.5. Questions? Um, would it be easier for, if, um, for the step where you have 1.001 and base 2 times 2 to a power? Could you just move the decimal point over? Ah, so, so you're saying move the decimal point, so you're saying like here, for example. Yeah, so you could do 100.1 and then, um, and then times 2 to the 0 and then just convert the 100 and convert the point 0.1. Yes, you could do that too. There are many ways to convert floats, um, and, and that is absolutely a valid way to do it. In this sort of small example, that makes sense. I think if you start getting really, really big, if I had like 23 bits after the decimal, maybe that's a little harder. So. Uh, but, but in this case, you're absolutely right. You could do that. Um, that's maybe how I would have done it if I were uh, just sort of, if you just said, hey, go, give me a flow, you know, give me the decimal. It's probably, I probably would have done that. Anything else? Question. Yep. How do you represent a true zero? How do you represent zero? That's a great question. Uh, let me get back to that in 10 minutes. Question? Yeah. Um, so can you explain what the bias is and why? Um, it determines the value. Yeah, so the, the idea behind the bias, so here you can see kind of in the formula, the way the bias is impacting it is if I take the four bits of the exponent, right, and I write them here, right, I'm, I'm treating those four bits as an unsigned int. And the bias is allowing me to get to negative powers of 2 and positive powers of 2. So. In this case, the four bits were an unsigned int representing the four bits, the four red bits here are an unsigned int representing the number nine. Um, and what that allows me to do is it allows me to represent, but what that's but what's actually going to come out, what the value is actually going to be is two to the two. Um, so there's kind of this, and, and so 
like I said, uh, yeah. So that's that's how we kind of convert it. Is when you read these bits out of the out of the uh, out of the binary, um, you got you have to you read them as an unsigned int and you subtract the bias to get the true exponent, sort of out here. Why isn't just a signed int used to represent the? So the question is, why isn't a signed int used to represent uh, used in the exponent? Uh, I want to give you a one sentence answer and then encourage you to look in the textbook because it's uh, a little messy. Which is that the problem is, um, if I used a signed int, then all the negative numbers kind of look, then all the negative numbers have kind of like a leading one, and so in some ways it kind of looks. If, if I just compared the bits, it would look greater uh, than if there were a leading zero. And we can actually do, and by using this kind of biased representation, we can represent, um, we, can, we can get a really nice uh, sort of, we can get a nice set of bit patterns basically, where comparison ends up becoming easier, but I can't really explain why that is unless I showed you the comparison, which I can't. But yeah, it turns out this makes some of the hardware easier, and it and it ends up re, uh, resulting in a really clever, interesting property. So how did we compute the bias again? The bias was computed as. Um, this might take a little while to go back. One second. Okay, the bias was computed as two to the number of bits in the exponent minus one, minus one. So roughly speaking, if you just had like just you know in your head roughly what is the bias, it's basically halfway between all zeros and all ones, right? So all zero exponent, you know, if I if I look at the all zeros as zero and I think of four ones, like one 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 as the number fifteen, then the bias is basically halfway between the two. So here's the official formula for that. I'll show you the biases for some of the other uh, float types later. Yeah. Um, are all decimal types uh, un or signed then? There's no like unsigned floats. There is no unsigned float. That is correct. <coughs> okay. Let me walk through. Um, let me walk through an example of going the other way. Uh, where okay, so here I've got the number negative five point oh. Just doing a negative for for the heck of it. And we can talk about how do we represent, now how do we go to the actual float bit pattern, so we're just going to go the other direction. First I need to convert it, uh, I'll, first I'll convert it to binary. Um, that seems a little bit easier, because I know how to convert it to binary. So we've got negative 101, one, base 2, I'm using the 2 here, just remind myself it's always in binary. And now I have to put it in scientific notation, right? So I've got to go, I've got to get to a position where I have one point something. I've got to fit it into this formula. And right now it doesn't fit in the formula because I've got too many bits before the, there's no point, right? But if there were a point kind of at the end, I've got too many bits. So I'll move the point from the end here back over. And I've got to get negative 1.01 .01 times 2 to the 2. So from here to here, all I did was I had a point, I had kind of an imaginary point at the end here, and I moved it two spaces over. This is just like the conversion of decimal numbers to scientific notation. And now I know what the significand is, right? It's just zero, one, and then we'll put a zero on the right. Because so this one now represents sort of one fourth, right? And then I've got um, so now I have to add the bias back in. So if the exponent is actually 2 to the 2, then following the formula, what we're going to get is what the, the bits of the exponent are actually 9. So that's how we represent that. Is okay? Why is there always a 1 in the front again? Why is there always a one at the front? The reason is that we, uh, so in 
decimal scientific notation, right? There was a, a whenever we do any, put any number in scientific notation before the decimal point, there's always going to be a, a digit from one to nine, right? Um, in binary, we don't have two through nine. So all we got is we have to put a bit, a one bit in front. If we put a zero bit in front, then it's not normalized, right? Then, because then if I put a zero in front, then I would get, I could potentially write, you know, 0 0.0000000001, at which point I should just move the binary point over and get a one point something. So it's, that's our way of keeping the significant kind of normalized, keeping it sort of within a range. We're going to keep it in the range from one to one point, however big, like 1.9 or two, almost two. Anything else? Uh, so here, from here to here, um, I want to get, I just want, I always want to get down to one point something. Right? So I've got 101, and then imagine there's a binary point right at the end here, right? Like, because it's a whole number, so I could just write this as, you know, 101 point. So I want to move the, the binary point over two spaces to the left so that I can get 1.01. And then because I moved it two spaces to the left, I need to multiply that back in. To do that, if you said that, um, said the, like we're, we're making a distinction between binary numbers and like decimal numbers. Uh, so that, so the, the idea is that, yeah. So the question is, or we're distinguishing between binary numbers and decimal numbers. The idea is that, so this is in binary. Um, when I, so this is also in binary. So it would be problematic if I took this and I said, oh, it's five, and I'll divide by ten and get one fifth or something. That would not be okay. But I'm staying in binary, um, so. Uh, I'm not, that, that's, you can't, so this dot is not really like a decimal point in the traditional sense. It's kind of a, it's a binary point. Um, so I can move, I can move it around just like I did, just like I do in decimal, as long as instead of multiplying by a power of 10, I multiply by a power of 2. Sorry? Uh, what's the point of subtracting the bias from the exponent? The point of subtracting the bias from the exponent here, let me, I'll, Put this example up, um, but essentially, imagine if I want to represent a negative exponent. Then now, but I said that the bits inside of the the mini float, the exponent bits in the mini float are an unsigned int, so I can't represent a negative exponent, right? So what I'll do is I'll use this bias to sort of allow me to represent both negative and positive exponents. So here. Um, I can represent 2 to the negative 1 using the bit pattern for 6, knowing that I could subtract the bias of 7 and get to a negative exponent. Uh, yeah, so you're asking why can I add the binary digit here? Um, for the same reason that if I wanted to write, uh, let's just say, I don't know, 1.23, I could write 1.230000, right? I can write on the right hand side of my decimal point, I can write as many zeros to the right as I'd like. Just like on the left hand side of my decimal point, I can write as many zeros to the left. So I'm allowed to write a zero to the right um, to kind of fill it in. Anything else? Okay. All right. Uh, quick note here that, so I've got both of these numbers, but I just kind of want to point out that this bit, this one bit, represents a different value depending on the exponent. So here is the number from the first example. Here is the number from the second example. And you can kind of see from the original that this one actually represents one eighth, whereas this one actually represents a whole one. And so I guess so. My the point that I just want to kind of make here, and you know, we'll we'll see this in lab. So maybe I'll just kind of uh, go a little bit more. But if it's um, but essentially that depending on the exponent. 
These three bits are actually interpreted differently. So this is very different than fixed point. We're not saying that this bit always represents a half and this bit always represents a fourth. Um, it's going to depend on the exponent. But, all right, well, here's an exercise that you can look at. I'll post the slides and you can try to walk through it. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll move on. Um, so, OK, so let me show you one issue, and then I guess we'll have to, uh, yeah. So let me just show you, so you, show you a couple last issues with this representation. And here, imagine if I'm trying to represent the number 8.5. So I can convert that to directly to binary. Eight converts as one zero zero zero, and then the point five is uh, one half. So that's the bit immediately after the binary point. But if I try to do something like this, where, um, but if I try to do something like I try to normalize it, I try to fit it into this formula, you'll notice that I run out of space. I only had space to put these three zeros, and then this last one didn't fit anymore. I only had three bits to write my significant. So that one gets lost. And what we end up with is we are not able to represent 8.5 using this system. We're able to represent 8.0, which is what we end up with over here, but we're not able to represent 8.5 um, because that's, that's a little too precise. Uh, for sort of this exponent. And so I'm introducing the idea of an epsilon, which is the sort of, we'll notice that the difference, sort of like the difference between eight and the number, the next representable number after eight is actually bigger than 0.5. It's actually a whole number. And you can see, um, you can work that, this out, that nine is the next representable number, and it's not, and so, so, the, so the gap, right? So we're actually out here where it's sort of interesting, right? Where before with the, the fixed point notation, you know, we always just had gaps of 1 16th, just sort of constant spaced gaps across the entire number line. But now we have these kind of variable gaps where close to 1 or close to 0, uh, I can represent these little fractions like 1 half and 1 fourth. We already saw a couple of those. I could represent 0.875. But then when I get out to 8 or 9 or you know, even bigger, now I can't even represent 0. 0.5. Yeah? Sorry, when you say epsilon of 8 is 9. Sorry, I, meant the, sorry I, I, I hand waved that quickly. The epsilon of 8 is 1, yeah, which is to say that the distance between 8 and the next number, or the epsilon kind of on the right, I guess, um, to the next highest number is 1 because that's how much the gap is. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll skip that. Here's the generalization of floating point in C. I have a code example, but I won't. Uh, I won't be able to get to it today. That's okay. Um, but essentially, um, so now I was in. I was in mini float. I had eight bits. Now I'm in C floats. Actually, I have a little bit of. Um, a little bit more time because I did start late. So um, I, I have, so now we can generalize our uh, floats to 32 bit or 64 bit. We don't have an 8 or a 16 bit number, a uh, 16 bit float type. Here's the, here are the numbers that you just might want to know. Um, I don't really, you know, like you'll just, you'll get used to these numbers, sort of like the twos complement thing. Um, you know, uh, so that's just going to be what that is. And, um, and yeah, there's a, there's a code example. Let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can do something quickly with the code example if I want to. Um, right, let me just do one quick thing with the code example that I think is kind of, is, is gonna be useful, and then I'll pick up with the rest of it. Um, I just wanna show you here this idea that I, I, like the idea that we went back to before of not being able to represent numbers like 0.2 and 
I just want to show that in GDB really quick, like what actually happens in code. So I was doing all the stuff in slides. Now, just a little bit of stuff in code. If I represent, so if I say float f equals 0 0.2, you know, it looks totally legit, right? But if I print out the value of f, we're not representing 0 0.2 exactly. And so in lab, we'll start to talk about some things like, hey, well, I can't represent 0 0.2 exactly, so what do we do? Right? Can I ask if this is, you know, equal to 0 0.2? That starts to get kind of, you know, we start to run into issues. I could try to represent 0 0.01, and we can't represent that exactly either. And so, I'm going to revisit some of these issues uh, on Monday, and then in lab, you know, how do we deal with these errors? And we'll see there are other sources of errors that we're going to also need to deal with. But we'll leave it at that for now. We'll pick this up again on Monday.